Good evening. Welcome to the Jewish Theological Seminary. It's wonderful to have you all with us tonight. Uh, this is one of our more exciting programs. I've been thinking about this program for a long, long time. Already a couple of years ago in my head, I hatched this idea that we should do a program for the Louis Finkelstein Institute on religion and the media. And uh, we literally have media stars with us tonight. Some of you are probably here for the first time, and I'm very happy to welcome you, and I hope you'll become regulars at our programming. I am Rabbi Bert Vysotsky. I serve as the Louis Stein Director of the Finkelstein Institute for Religious and Social Studies. Uh, the Institute has been around since 1938, doing programming of intergroup activities and public policy, uh, trying to engage various groups in dialogue, and hence tonight's public policy, I guess, program on religion and the media. Tonight's program is also JTS's Jack and Lewis Rudin Lecture. The Rudin Lecture Series at JTS provides the opportunity for eminent academics, religious leaders, intellectuals, public figures to discuss topics of interest with the JTS community. Although Jack and Susan Rudin unfortunately are not with us this evening, we'd like to take this opportunity to extend our thanks to them for sponsoring the lecture, which is named for Mr. Rudin and his late brother, Lewis. We're also happy to welcome two representatives of the Rudin Foundation, Mr. John Lewin, you're back, there you are, and uh, the Vice President and Program Director, Mark Bodden, uh, an, an old friend of JTS. I, I was saying to our panel that I was tempted to uh, introduce them somewhat tongue-in-cheek um, and play what's my line, because um, when they come up, you will be somewhat mystified and um, but my introduction is going to give it away anyway, because two of the four panelists are Jewish, and uh, you know, you can decide who. Uh, but uh, <laughs> let me actually introduce them. Uh, Juju Chang is an Emmy Award-winning correspondent for ABC News. She uh, is on Nightline. She reports regularly for Good Morning America 2020 and hosts Moms Get Real a digital show for ABC News Now. And she used to be the news anchor for Good Morning America. Those of you who are early birds will know her well and a producer at World News Tonight. Paul Brandeis Rauschenbusch is senior religion editor for the Huffington Post. He was the original, an original and contributing editor at beliefnet.com and has appeared on ABC, World News Tonight, CNN, and NPR. I'm gonna give one away. Um, Paul Brandeis Rauschenbusch is an ordained Baptist minister. Um, and he served as the Associate Dean of Religious Life and Chapel at Princeton University. Um, Brent Staples writes on a wide range of topics, including politics, culture, race, education, housing, consumer economics, juvenile justice, and prison policy. Most of you read him fairly regularly and don't know you're reading him because he is a member and a lead writer for the New York Times editorial board. He's a frequent contributor to the Times Magazine and the Book Review, and he served as an assistant metropolitan editor, boy, that was a long time ago, um, and editor of the Book Review. Our moderator for tonight's panel is Nicholas Lemon, Dean of the Graduate School of Journalism and, at Columbia University. Under Nick's leadership, now going into its ninth year, the school has launched significant new initiatives in investigative reporting, digital journalism, and executive leadership for news organizations. Lemon has published five books and is a staff writer in his spare time for The New Yorker. And uh, in fact, those of you who got The New Yorker yesterday in your mailboxes, you can see a 10,000 word article um, on Brazil. Um, I, being the good Jewish boy that I am, did my homework and stayed up very late last night uh, reading it. And uh, as usual, Nick writes with panache, and it's just chock full of information. Um, I would like to ask all of you who took the opportunity coming in to get um, index cards. If you have a question now, you can write it down now on your index card, and uh, the ushers will collect them and bring them up. There will be a second round for questions. Now, don't be shy. If you write a question now, you can raise your hand, and the ushers will bring you yet another card if you want to ask a second question. Um, and uh, I, I should warn you, 
I will be reading through the questions first, then I will hand them on to Dean Lemon, who will also vet them. Um, you can save yourself the trouble if your burning question is, why does the New York Times hate Israel? Um, I, <laughs> I don't know that we're going to address that directly. Um, but uh, I do want to take a pause while you have the opportunity to write down whatever questions you may have at the outset and invite our panelists to join us here on the stage. Thank you, Bert, for the generous introduction and for staging this event and planning it. Um, and thanks to all of you for coming. Um, just in case it isn't obvious, I'm Nick Lemon, this is Brent Staples, this is Chu Chu Chang, and this is Paul Rauschenbusch. Um, so uh, just to start, um, there's this squishy, eternal question that, that somebody with my job has to face all the time, which is, how does the media cover X? Is, does it cover it well or does it cover it badly? Um, and the reason uh, that question is, is a difficult one is um, it, it's, there, there actually is a, a sort of somewhat benighted branch of social science that studies things like that by measuring exactly how many stories and how many column inches and how they're slanted. But usually when you have this conversation with people, they read one story that they either love or hate and say, see, the media is either great or fabulous. And then you're kind of off in this world of generalizations and, and um, it's hard to get out of it once you enter it. So I want to start uh, just by, by trying to be somewhat more specific than that. And I'll ask each of our panelists to begin by just telling us in your three very different news organizations in which you work, um, tell us a little bit about how religion gets covered there. Um, how is the work organized? Who does it? What are you trying to achieve? Um, and if you feel like uh, being uh, uh, disloyal and complaining about the quality or loyal and praising the quality, feel free. But just, just be a little descriptive about how your news organization conceives of and executes the coverage of religion. Paul, why don't you start? <clears throat> okay, uh, well let me start by saying I'm very glad to be here and uh, I attended seminary right across the street and uh, would come over here and uh, marvel at the history and um, the beauty of, of this seminary. Um, so I'm going to start by just telling you a little bit about how HuffPost religion started. Um, I, religion was on the Huffington Post since the very beginning because <coughs> through the words, the writings of various uh, religious leaders and academics, through largely bloggers, um, I uh, was you know, working in religion at BeliefNet and approached Ariana about starting a religion, special religion vertical. Um, and she was very interested in that. And, and while I was at Princeton for my first two years of working at, at Huffington, I, um, I did both jobs. Let me slow you down for a minute. What is HuffPost, who is Ariana, and what's a vertical? I'm just speaking on behalf of those audience members who I know are asking those questions but are afraid to ask. I'm so sorry, that's a, yeah. Write them down in cards, we promise. Uh, no, it's, uh, okay, um, Huffington Post is a, uh, is a uh, online uh, news uh, uh, and media uh, company. It's now the AOL Huffington Post Media Group, um, but it's uh, largely a Huffington Post and AOL now. Um, and it is uh, Ariana Huffington was the founder of the Huffington Post, uh, and she was a public figure, an intellectual, a political figure as well. Um, and a vertical is a section. So uh, that is an area. Organized around a topic. That surrounds a topic. So another one would be politics. Another one would be um, 
now uh, uh, green entertainment. So religion is, is, is one of those. Um, and, and so- and For those not familiar, Huffington Post is only a few years old, but has an astonishingly huge audience of 35 or 40 million people a month or something? Or? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, um, I mean, a, 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 an interesting moment uh, happened a couple weeks ago where we had a billion page views in a day. <laughs> um, because with uh, with AOL, you know, kind of, it's the the reach is is has become extraordinary. Um, so, so the um, let me let me say, how do we cover religion? Right now, I have um, on my staff, I have a full time religion reporter. So we do have um, we we go out, we uh, we decide what we want to cover. We we um, cover stories in that way. We also run religion news service stories. So we have a lot of stories about religion, but a major idea behind HuffPost religion is that we are also a place where religious leaders, academics, religious academics, um, public intellectuals can, um, can actually talk about religion from their own perspective. So we're not, we're, we, we are a site that's about religion, but we're also a site that is religion in the sense that there is, um, there is religious comment, commentary, there is uh, uh, people talking about the Bible, people talking about the Quran. From the religious perspective itself, I think this is influenced by the fact that I am a, uh, a religious leader myself, so I have a, you know, an interest in promoting a positive, productive religious conversation on the site. And so that's, I think, perhaps enough for now. Uh, Juju, how does it work at ABC News? ABC News is so vastly different than HuffPost. Uh, I can't even begin to tell you. Um, I work at Nightline, and each of the shows have their own um, story editors and senior editors. Um, HuffPost and the way that you run the coverage is so elegant. The way that we do it is very guerrilla. Um, we, you know, what we don't have a designated with religion a, with correspondent. A U or an o? You. Okay. Uh, we used to, in the sort of late 80s, early 90s, had a religion correspondent by the name of Peggy Waymeyer, who was um, given that beat by Peter Jennings, who felt that religion should be covered, in, you know, on a national um, forum. Um, that lasted the better part of a decade, but since then we have a terrific correspondent by the name of Dan Harris who covers a lot of religion issues. But I talked to him today uh, to prepare for tonight and I said, so, you know, what do you think about our coverage? And he said, you know, I tend to fetishize, you know, religion. I tend to do the sort of, you know, Christian yoga, Christian rock, you know, kosher sex the kinds of stories that fetishize in some way, you know, religious aspects of life. Um, but at the same time, he takes, you know, we as a network news organization look at stories that have conflict and controversy. So then we uh, find these stories that are, are colorful characters, which who are often controversial. There's this whole slice of religious coverage that I would consider the hypocrisy piece, the, you know, right, the Pastor Eddie Long, unfortunately named, mm -hmm. the Atlanta minister who was caught in relationships with young boys, the, you know, the... While right, being a primary, like, anti-gay crusader. Yeah. Anti-gay, right, the hypocrisy gets, sort of, the, you know, Jimmy Swagger, the, all of those sort of, you know, the long list of pedophile priests, so there's that sort of hypocrisy thing, so there's the... You know, but then there's also these colorful voices that come out, whether it's the Koran burning pastor in Florida who has a congregation of, what, 15, 20, um, who gets a national voice, or the Warren Jeffs, the splinter, you know, uh, uh, Mormon sect leader who was being charged with, you know, marrying underage girls. So the, it's this sort of crazy, messy, sloppy coverage that doesn't necessarily do justice to religion in America. And yet, I think that we also understand that there is a great hunger in this country for issues of faith and matters of belief. And um, so in that vein, we have launched a number of series that I think take a very, um, sort of comprehensive look at things that intrigue Americans but are somewhat ecumenical. So we had a whole series um, called Belief Matters where we look at um, different issues, again, sort of 
populated by colorful characters, but that might bring up you know, something in Buddhism or something in, in the Muslim faith or something that sort of um, brings up universal issues of faith and belief. I think there's this whole other segment of coverage that we do that I call like sort of the Dr. Oz coverage, which is I remember doing stories of here's your brain, here's your brain on prayer. Right, you know, those like <laughs> religious people are 10% happier than secular people. You know, all these studies that we look at. So we do that kind of segmented coverage too, but I think, you know, I have a lot more to say and a lot more to say, but I think that ultimately the way that we cover it is the way that we cover a lot of uh, issues in America. We cover what our reporters and our editors and our senior staff find interesting. Let me ask both of you before we go to Brent, just quickly, <clears throat> my judgment is Brent does not have the ability at his organization to track the audience of each story, but you guys do much more. So is religion coverage uh, box office poison or box office magic? I would say probably more magic than poison. Uh -huh. um, you know, it, there's, there's some stories that are are duller than others, but some religion is duller than others. Uh, but uh, but I think what you know perhaps surprised the whole Huffington Post group the the month we launched the section was that after politics we were almost immediately the biggest section on the site, and people mm -hmm. were just like, "What happened?" Mm -hmm. uh, now you know I won't say that we're you know there's there's a lot of, of you know some days good days, other days bad days. Where it's poison is, is that it's tricky. And one of the things that I spend a lot of time doing is trying to make sure that, um, that on my site, Hindus, Muslims, Jews, Christians feel equally welcome. And that's where the poison can come in very quickly if, it's, if there, it becomes a, a sense of, oh, you're favoring. You know, that's the poison. Um, I have to say, I, I work in an industry where we get minute by minute ratings. <laughs> so we literally know minute by minute what people are turning on and turning off. Um, now, I spent the better part of, you know, the 80s, the late 80s and early 90s believing what we all believed, which is that we had to stay away from religion. It was too controversial. People turned it off. But lately, there has been a macro shift um, because what we've discovered is religion rates. Religion rates when it's, it's framed in a way that's provocative and interesting and appeals to people who have are questioning, which I think sort of summarizes most people. So we did face-off town halls at Nightline that rated well, um, but it, they were always questions of, um, does Satan exist? Does God have a future? Um, they're all very provocative, and we would have a face-off debate. And it is part of the, the, the strength of television is that we reach these millions of people, but a lot of the weakness of television is that we often have two voices that seem equally ma matched, but can often be extreme, can not, often be not very representative of mainstream America, and I think therein lies one of the weaknesses of television. Uh, Brent, how does the Times cover religion? <clears throat> well, I have to say, um, I've been out of the newsroom for a while. I write editorials, as he told you, and I was once uh, in the newsroom as a system metropolitan editor, and one of the gentlemen who was our religion writer at the time is uh, Ari Goldman, who now teaches at Columbia Journalism School. So we have religion writer, typically speaking, um, who follows that subject. Um, One, two? Mm -hmm. I don't know if they're two now, I'm not sure. But because uh, the- but Not person, hundreds of them. No, but the, the uh, you know, leadership has changed and so the, the assignments are shifting. But there's typically a religion writer or someone who's writing a religion column. Um, and so maybe two. Um, however, on the other side of the wall, in the opinion section, we, uh, we don't have a religion writer. There's no one on the editorial board who covers religion per se. And in the newspaper in general, religion comes in to the paper as it appears in the news, um, as uh, Mitt Romney's Mormonism, uh, as in um, priests' sexual abuse of children, as in um, fundamentalist pastors as they appear in the campaign. You know, Reverend Wright doing the 
Obama campaign. So it comes in that way. And to, so these are stories that essentially are sort of a bevel in which religion is wedged into politics, per se. Uh, but in, gen in the news media in general, the question of faith, I think, is not one that's regularly pursued or regularly explored in a non-controversial way. And just to give you a little, uh, a little background, we were talking before we came in, um, I am the great-grandson of a Baptist minister who preached at a churches on the National Registry of Buildings in Virginia, a famous <gasps> minister named Reverend Frank Patterson. And his daughter, my grandmother, was a famous singing evangelist. And her husband was uh, also a minister. And my mother is sort of a lay preacher. And my wife is an ordained minister. <laughs> so I mean, I don't wear it on my shoulder, uh, but I have some experience. <laughs> um, a couple You're of clearly not the Jew. <laughs> yeah. Don't be so sure. Um, when uh, the, the uh, newly minted uh, executive editor of, of the Times, Jill Abramson, was, report, was originally appointed, uh, she got in a little spot of trouble uh, by saying publicly, uh, you know, when she was interviewed a few times about the appointment, in the house I grew up in, which was, um, you know, a, a Jewish household in Manhattan, uh, the New York Times was our religion. Uh, that's how devoted we were to the Times. And she said that by way of saying, um, you know, the Times was, was of supreme importance to her and had been for her her life. But it, that was widely viewed as a remark she should not have made. And, and a lot of bloggers sort of jumped in and said, um, you see, we were right, especially religious and conservative bloggers, you see we were right all along. These people in the mainstream liberal media are unbelievably secular and, and so to them a newspaper is their religion that says it all. Uh, is that fair? As, as not, not so much about Jill, but about the sort of sociology um, and ambient ideology of mainstream newsrooms, that it's a bunch of people who <coughs> skew, compared to the general population of the US, very secular, and who sort of don't get religion? I would say that, <coughs> it, I would say that uh, without fear of contradiction, uh, that most reporters are um, not intimately involved in issues of faith. Mm -hmm. In their personal lives. Yeah, I, I doubt it very seriously. And I, mean, and I think that part of the problem is that the enterprise of journalism casts itself as a hyper-rational enterprise. And you remember Nathaniel Nash? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, a lot of, I think, at, there was a certain time, in fact, in journalism, in my lifetime, when people who were people of faith might have felt that they might, could, should conceal that because it might somehow give them less credibility in this hyper-rational world that they were working in. You know? um, but also, you know, the, it, it, the journalism attracts a lot, of, you know, a lot of intellectuals from the Northeast, and they, they sort of stream out of um, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and and that kind of thing. So they tend to be um, godless. They, no, they, <laughs> they they tend to be people who pride themselves in rationalism and objectivity, and that's 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 the that's the coin of the realm there. You know. Do you want to add to that, or? Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, it's, it's harder for me because I'm kind of professionally religious, so. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I, I can, I can only, you know, my, and most of my experience is within, um, is within uh, religious journalism at BeliefNet and then um, really coming in to be a religious voice within an organization that really, I mean, uh, the, the founder, Ariana Huffington, was very, very interested in it, and she herself has a deep you know, spiritual belief and history in the Orthodox Church. So, but I think, you know, it's not like, 
you know, it's not like we have big prayer sessions at Huffington Post. I mean, that's for sure. It couldn't hurt. Couldn't hurt. Exactly. <laughs> Believe me. Uh, you know, I call them. It's just that no one comes. Uh, but no, yeah, but I, I, I think that there's a... Mm, I think there's an interest. I think it's just that people don't want to feel like they can want to tread in something that they don't really know. Mm-hmm. And I think other 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 things are more quant, kind of quantifiable mm-hmm. in a way than faith. And so faith is or religion, religious practice. And I think the fetishization is a really interesting way to put it. Um, like how do you how do you treat something that you you yourself feel is is other? But you know, it, we were talking earlier, and it also the, the the inexperience of journalists in religion uh, turns up in the coverage. Mm. And uh, one of the, the, I guess, the most glaring examples when, was when Obama was running for the presidency and he went to speak in black churches or went to speak in the black congregations and, or the NAACP. And his, the speeches he gave were reported in a way that startled him and uh, somehow made those of us who grew up black in America roll our eyes. How so? Well, what, one of the things with Obama, when he, when he was running for office, he went into these black churches and gave these speeches about personal responsibility and fatherhood mm-hmm. and doing the right thing and so forth and so on. And these often appeared in news stories, almost exclusively appeared in news stories as Obama chastises lazy Negroes. Obama yeah. chastises his immoral. Right, he chastises yeah. Negroes to do better by themselves, and he he makes these sort of like these sort of really intense speeches to these people and sort of wags his finger. And for those spe- those stories are written by people who had obviously never been in a black church, because if you've ever been in a black church from the 1950s forward, I mean, on every tenth Sunday. Um, especially in the South, there was this there was this sermon about pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and personal responsibility and living right and how you'd be judged in the end if you did not. And very pointed, and because yet partly just, and this ties into I think the in, the long-standing inability of the press to see into the black community. Uh, as, as a person who you see is visibly black, um, I often have a, what I s- describe as an out-of-body experience when I read stories about race in the newspaper. Not my newspaper, any newspaper, or even watch them on TV. Um, because oftentimes they don't comport with my, exp- comport with my life experience. You know? um, so basically, People did. People who were trying to, the reporters, the team of reporters who were on the bus who were coming in to cover this speech, they had no reference for the antecedents of what the rhetoric of the black church was and no way to judge what the guy was saying. So it does, in fact, uh, come in. And it, 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 it inflicts a kind of blindness on the news coverage. I was um, talking to Dan Harris this correspondent at ABC News who covers religion extensively and is actually writing a book called 10% Happier about Mm -hmm. religion. And and he said, but the difference between you and me, Juju, is that you're a person of faith and I'm not. And I said, well, do you believe this question of, you know, the journalists are less likely to be religious? And he said, well, you know, I I believe that. I think it's safe to say yes. He said, uh, and he's given a lot of thought to this question. And he said, you know, they tend to be Jewish or secular or often both. And uh, jokingly, tongue in cheek. And then he said, but uh, so uh, later after our conversation, I looked it up um, using my friend, Mr. Google. And there was a 2007 Pew Center report that looked at journalists' self identification. And I think it was eight or nine percent, sing- single upper single digits of journalists, working journalists, said that they go to a church or synagogue every week. Um, compared to 39% of the general public who say that they attend, you know, a house of worship once a week, which doesn't say one or the other, but there is a disconnect in the way the um, journalists may be looking at these issues, and I agree um, that that we come at it from a hyper-rational perspective. We also, I think, by nature, are 
questioning people, we're skeptical people. We had a whole series at Nightline this summer called Beyond Belief. And the tagline was beyond hope, beyond faith, beyond what the eye can see. Is there something beyond belief? And we sort of played in that realm of looking at exorcism, looking at uh, the search for Mary, people who believe miracles that you know are ascribed to the Virgin Mary. Um, we looked at, I looked, I did an hour on twin tuition about twins who are separated who believe that their souls are merged and you know this incredibly chilling tale of these twins who one died in a car accident and well was one was comatose after a car accident and his twin felt his spirit there until one day you know he literally felt he you know, felt his brother's spirit disappear. We talked about afterlife issues, and these are the issues that I think people who may not necessarily see themselves as, you know, Christian or Jewish or Muslim are all intrigued by, matters of faith, matters of belief, and I think that is where people can tune in for a good story, um, and, and, you know, I would argue that character-driven narratives are where you can uh, impart a lot of knowledge, a lot of questioning. I actually did a story this summer, and you know, I will, the jig is now up, I'm Jewish, uh, <laughs> by uh, choice. And I converted late in life after meeting a nice freckle-faced boy named Neil Shapiro. Um, and after we were married and after we had a, a son, I announced to him that I was gonna convert. And he, you know, had this moment, we went through beginner's Judaism class together for a year and you know for the first time in our 12 year relationship was talking about do you believe in God, do you believe in an afterlife, what do you believe, and we had never discussed it before and I think that that is what, that is how most Americans live is you know you live without thinking about those and are engaging in those issues and I think as a person of faith now I think it's safe to say um, I bring that to my journalism. So I did a story this summer um, about a family with 19 biological children. Um, and yes, it is because their faith dictates to them that they're gonna allow God to dictate the number of children that they're gonna have. But I came at it with a very open-minded perspective. And I really, within short order, became sort of the fourth jaded New Yorker to fall in love with this family and fall in <laughs> love with the way that they raised their children in rural Tennessee and really understood the beauty and the simplicity of a lot of what they were doing. And when the story finally aired, you know, and they had modest clothing, which, you know, there was this scene in the hour that I did where I went to Walmart and purchased a swimming outfit with the sun. And, you know, it was just, it was really sweet. And afterwards, the response from the audience was you were so respectful to this family and mm -hmm. that there was a you know I didn't treat it as these crazy people who had this crazy belief I came at it as a person of faith who wanted to understand their faith mm -hmm. and I think that it made a difference in the way that the story came out which is not to say that I didn't ask hard questions I did there was one child that they had um, because the mother was having trouble having pregnancies and she started using progesterone post-conception. So I had this sort of debate with her, wait, you're not going to intervene with contraception, but you will intervene with modern medicine to have more children. So then we had this sort of theological debate about what is it, you know, that your religion is, is saying to you. Um, but I think that we come at matters of religion in these tales um, in a kind of sideways way, and, and, and there are many opportunities to do that. You remind me of something. It's oftentimes that you don't well, as a writer, um, um, you're not fully aware of the things that are animating your work. I mean, Absolutely. I'm not, you know, I do, of course, do, I do editorials in 12 different subjects. I mean, you know, the economy, I mean, the credit card law, banking law, lots of different things. Um, and, you know, usury comes in there. And uh, <laughs> at some point I was writing about, I was writing about credit card law and I described the interest rates as usurious usurious in an editorial. And that was not just a word that came out of, you know, University of Chicago where I went to school. Um, uh, also, I was, I read a long series of, of stories about um, disenfranchisement of ex-offenders and uh, many, many columns about uh, poor medical treatment of prison inmates and the age HIV rates. And I, and I wrote those, looked back on them with a particular passion, you know. And my mother-in-law, you know, would read these things. 
And then she'd write me a little note, and she'd recite the scripture. What you do to the least of these, you do to me. And I realized that in fact, you know, I had grown up with that. And so my, I'm being animated in that direction, partly by that ethical push and that direct reference, you know? And she said, she said all the time, whenever I read your work, she said, I think of that. I think of that scripture, you know? That Jesus saying, what you do to the least of these, you do to me. So one is often not aware it, you know, it happens sometimes pre-conscious, you know, the things that Freud would say, uh, pre-conscious, subconscious, the things that animate you to do what you do. Um, let's say we lived in an ideal world uh, from the standpoint of the topic we're on, in which um, the, you know, news organizations really got it about religion and, and individual reporters did and editors did and they gave it the importance and the resources it deserved. What stories would we do in that ideal world that we're not doing or not doing enough of or not doing right now? Well, I think one, I, th I think there would, be, um, there would be more thought given um, to interfaith dialogue and more sort of writing about where that was occurring, you know? Uh, also, I, I oftentimes when, I'm, when there's someone um, uh, who's, who's advancing a, a fairly strident religious view about uh, a, 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 who are, who's marshaling religion in, in sort of, in say, support of the death penalty, or, or in support of some sort of grand, uh, draconian social policy. Um, I will immediately, in my mind, think of a scriptural rebuttal to that person, you know? And actually, you know, as, as an essayist, uh, probably, should, probably should do more of correcting people in that way, you know? Are there answers to that? Well, I'll, as a, as a place where we do a lot of interfaith uh, uh, stories, and um, you know, part of the part of the trick, of course, is you know, in this perfect world, and I assume that means that um, it doesn't matter what people consume in the media. Right. Exactly. Uh, because just... I think that we're talking a lot about what we produce, but I think everyone here should talk a, think about how we consume media, yeah. because I sometimes say that I can kind of pay for the interfaith story that almost nobody clicks on, even though I give it the featured spot, mm -hmm. with one thing about the, the last 10 stupid things that Pat Robertson has said. Mm -hmm. You know, I can pay for my month because mm -hmm. I can get so much traffic out of that mm -hmm. that I can afford to put five interfaith stories that won't come to a tenth of that. Mm -hmm. Because all of us aren't that interested in the nice story. We're just not. I mean, you know, we, there's a few stories that, that maybe break through in the interfaith world that actually gain some traction. There was one of like, a, uh, you know, these Muslim cab drivers that took over a kosher bagel shop that actually oh, yeah, like did that well, story. That you know. Cool. Um, you know, I mean, so I you can, you can sometimes story. get in there, but, <laughs> but a lot of the, the kind of, you know, oh, some kids from different traditions, you know, cleaned up a park together. You know, I mean, so, so the, I guess the, you know, <laughs> I, and, and I'm someone who spent hours and hours organizing those things at Princeton. Well, you know, I'm talking about <laughs> and like nobody cares. Well, so so. I'm, 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 I'm talking about, I mean, I don't want to get too theological heavy here, but uh, I'm saying writing about the overlap and the great religion. Right. I mean, so much, so much of what we write about in the press, if, I mean, for, for people who are unschooled, you would think, that you know the mainstream face had nothing in common, and, no, and that, I, and that, I mean, and that I, they, I'm and agreeing that they came, with you that, that they emerged good. out of a vacuum somewhere, I, completely distinct I, from I, one I, another. I would offer a, even a sort of more simple and basic idea about this, which is, for the most part, the press is is reluctant to cover religion per se or on its own terms, the religious right. world. 
Um, instead, it has to be a kind of a one cushion shot or two cushion shot. Religion is news when it affects some other realm that oh, we're socialized to think of as the real news. <clears throat> to use a possibly good and possibly strained analogy, <laughs> if you think about the way the mainstream press uh, covered hip hop when it first emerged, the mainstream press, it was, well, does it increase crime? And what about the jewelry these guys wear? And it was never, let's understand this as an art form on in its itself. Own terms, yeah. yeah, it was always, what is its effect on something else? It was the independent variable, and the story was about the dependent variable. And then suddenly, the New York Times, for example, sort of ostentatiously said, it's time to get it about hip hop and have a hip hop critic who doesn't care about all those other issues of its effect and just understands it as a form of music. Um, it, it's a version of that with religion where a, a, a religion story is only a story. It's like the old, uh, I don't think true adage about journalism school that we teach you that if a man bites a dog and a dog bites a man and stuff like that. It's a religion is only news if it affects some other realm that isn't religion. Just as a tiny personal example, if you all remember the Jason Blair story of 2002 or three or whenever it was. The plagiarism story? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, well he did a lot of things that he should, that, should yeah. not have done. Yeah. And it led to a great... Upheaval in the firmament. Yes, and, and so there was this guy uh, then at the New York Times who was sort of the Yoda of the New York Times named Al Siegel, a wonderful guy who was put in charge of this commission or series of commissions to sort of re-examine everything about the New York Times and they'd invite witnesses to come to their hearings. And I was invited to come to one of their hearings. And this particular one was a, kind of got on the subject of the Times coverage of religion. Um, and I made some of the argument I just made. And several of the people around the table said, what are you talking about? Give me an example. And I used as an example at the time the controversy at JTS, which is now, of course, completely over and forgotten about gay ordination of rabbis, or ordination of gay rabbis. And it was very striking. Everybody at the table said, that's not a story. Why is that a story? Um, and I said, because I'm guessing a plurality of the readers of the New York Times might be conservative Jews, and this is kind of, you know, <laughs> the Vatican of conservative Jews, or whatever image you want to use, and it's, it's a really, really important issue. But it, because it was about religion, qua religion, and it didn't break out of the religious world, it was almost definitionally not a story. Um, so I, to me, that's the barrier the press needs to break through. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I think where that has maybe started to break down is, is the internet. Right, exactly. Uh, because, yeah. because religious I people agree. are se searching for things that they care about, and they don't need to go through the New York Times front page to get there. They can no. search for it. Yeah, I know, isn't that weird? Uh, you know, I mean, Bite your tongue. I mean, especially now with the paper. I've, I've, uh, I've been letting you get away with that. I, 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 there was no reason to single out the New York Times on that. It, it, that it's just, all I'm saying is it, it can also be ABC News. It, you know, people, no. Now them fighting I'm, words. Okay, I'm, now I'm really getting myself into trouble here. But all, I, all I'm really saying is if you care about the JTS gay ordination question, you can type it in, and yeah. you will get stuff on that because a lot of people care about it and are writing about it. And I, I, I've, I've told this story where there was a controversy in the evangelical world about a, an evangelical pastor who had written a book called Love Wins that, um, that you know, he, where he questions the principle of hell. And this was an up-and-coming star. And someone wrote a blog post about this thing, and I just published it, and I didn't even feature it at all. And it was like, what is this doing? It has a half a million people looking at this thing. What's going on? It was a story that was completely beyond my radar. But it came into my radar quick because I saw so many people cared about it. So it didn't matter if I knew it was news. The world out there knew it was news. And that's the difference that the internet, internet is making on religion coverage. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and the, the only thing that I'd say to complicate it is, and not that this is a bad thing, but, but you know, the, the sweet spot for sort of old-fashioned journalism is 
we just make these judgments about what's important and then we cover them dispassionately. Uh, the internet is fabulous at assembling communities of special interest, but doesn't value dispassion so highly. It's mm. a sort of it's discourse of, of membership rather than of observation. So, so you're still not exactly in this notional target of getting that religion is important, covering it qua religion, and dispassionately. But, but maybe it, that's but impossible. You, but it can it come can come to. Um, it can come to our awareness, and then we can write exactly. a story yeah. about it. Yeah. But I'm saying that that's really a, a great tool for us who are interested in then covering yeah. the story. I'm going to call I'm, a pause for a moment um, for three reasons. Number one, earlier um, Nick mentioned a, a former religion correspondent for the New York Times, Ari Goldman, who I'm sure many of you in this room uh, read regularly, and I do want to recognize his presence in the audience. Uh, second of all, we're utterly, thoroughly delighted to have Jack and Susan Rudin here with us tonight. So thank you, and thank you for your ongoing support. And third, as they used to say, keep those cards coming in. Um, I just handed Nick a, a pile of cards, which he will soon get to with our, our panelists. Um, I'm also going to take a moment to out Nicholas, um, because uh, we kind of know about the religious affiliation of everyone else here. And Nicholas Lemon um, is the son-in-law of a conservative rabbi, a graduate of this institution, and we're proud of it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, right, so the last time I was in this room, my wife was sitting on this stage speaking, and, uh, and then after the event, my mother-in-law came up to me and said, I'm finally happy. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that's a Jewish mother story. Um, Genius. That's, that's anyway, I'm going to go to these questions, but Juju, I thought I saw a little sort of expectant look on your face, so before I go to... Well, it's, just, it's a minor thing. I, you know, I, I think that... The question of how can we can cover religion better uh, in television news runs along the lines of the question that I'm often asked by you know friends and people I run into, which is, why don't you ever cover happy news? You know, and the truth is, we don't do a lot of happy stories about the guy who goes to work and, and raises his family beautifully. We do the story about the guy who goes to work and kills his colleague or sleeps with his you know, mistress. And that is the way that we cover religion. And, and so the one flaw that I find very deep and uh, uh, sort of intractable is that we often quote extreme views. And there was another um, piece of data that I have in this stack, which I won't thumb through, but basically what it said is that um, it was a Faith Matters survey, and it found that of the quotes that Network News took, they far more often, three times more often, took conservative Christian, um, conservative Christian sound bites over progressive or moderate views. Um, and so that, that's the kind of sociological research that you alluded to that suggests that we skew our reality more extreme, mm -hmm more conservative than, than perhaps what it should be. Okay, so I'm gonna now ask a question that sort of follows nicely on some of what we've been talking about. What is the most important issue about religion that most people don't know or that the media is not paying enough attention to? <coughs> and anybody can take that. I have to say the extent to which Christian conservatives dominate public policy. I mean, I've done a number of stories where I have been amazed whether it was, um, you know, gay marriage, which is, you know, obviously you find Christian conservative groups, you know, the Family Research Council, others backing um, uh, statewide uh, initiatives that will ban gay marriage. And, and t in many cases, they consider it the tip of the spear of their um, assault on sort of gay rights. Um, so that's kind of, but, but the extent to which they fund other things, for example, I did a story about um, bullying, gay bullying that ended up in a murder for 2020. And I was surprised to learn that um, a lot of the statewide initiatives that are anti-bullying legislation are fought by Christian conservatives because they might um, have anti-gay terminology in it, and so it's considered part of the gay agenda. And so there is no anti-bullying money that is allowed because it's struck down. Those are the kinds of you know, issues that I wish came up more in the reporting. Um, and, and I've tried to, 
to put it into pieces that I've done, but it's 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 incredible to me the extent to which public policy is affected by by extreme groups. I think that uh, about, I don't know about ten years ago, Alan Wolf, the guy from Boston University, wrote a book, and um, it's uh, and it was it was basically it was a, basically a book about ecumenism. Um, and I remember, because I remember I reviewed it for the Times, and there was a passage in it in which he was in some place in the Midwest, some poor place in the South and Midwest, and he was asking um, some guy, you know, how much religion should be taught at school. And the guy said, you know, he said well, no, I don't really mind, you know, I don't really mind having religion at school. He said, but what I'd like to see, I would like to see maybe they should teach, you know, um, Christianity one week, Buddhism another week, um, some other things another week. And people, you know, I think that the, the number of people who are extreme, in my view, statistically small number, they just heard a lot more. Uh, and I do have, I do have, uh, I mean, at, 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 at the, <laughs> to be black and have faith in progress. I mean, you really have to be, you have to be an Americanist and you have to believe that the country will rise to the values that were basically inherent in the Constitution and Declaration of Independence despite their flaws in the initial Constitution. You have to believe that. And I do believe that Americans, even though they lurch from time to time to extremists, Americans really are, they are moderate people. They are. And I think, and I think that you know, in times of extre in times of extreme economic distress, we see different sides of people, of course. But I think over the long haul, Americans are a moderate people. And I don't think that the kind of extremism we hear so much of is um, what dominates the national palate actually. Um, do you want to add, Paul? Um, the only thing that I, I think is really interesting that I try that I'm trying to do more of in a, what is considered a mainstream or somewhat mainstream media uh, outlet, uh, Huffington Post, is actually getting into theology and trying to help people understand one another's theology a little bit better. Like, what actually do Muslims believe? Right. Uh, and what right. do they, you know, what do they do during Ramadan? And and what, you know, how is uh, how are the high holidays observed in Judaism? And really, like, um, really understand, like, what is the scriptural re relevance? What is like the historical way this holiday evolved? All those kind of things that are actually, to me, fascinating. And I think they actually track. I mean, our biggest, you know, sellers as far as pieces are like. You know, what does the Bible say about this? Um, you know, understanding the Quran, those kind of pieces do really well and surprisingly well. Uh, and I think people really want to know about each other. And the great thing about the internet is that you actually don't have to go up to someone of a different faith and say, what do you believe? You actually can, <laughs> if you have a trusted news source, go right. there and say, oh, okay, I'm beginning to understand it. Right. Let me read another question. Um, since the Arab Spring, the media has been referring to Islamists. What is an Islamist, and how does it differ from a Salafist, Wahhabi, M Muslim Brotherhood? <laughs> it's a quiz question. Reverend? <laughs> yeah, because I'm such an Islam expert. Um, I actually think that the Islamist is, 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 a, is a political term. Uh, so it's a political Islam, and actually it is connected to Wahhabism and, and uh, Muslim Brotherhood, or like wh how we view um, people who are um, engaged in, the, in a, a very clear sort of effort to um, use the Muslim faith, the Islamic religion, to, um, to further a political goal, which oh, they, is... Oh they, oh, they see it as a form of governance. Well, it's not, it, but it's also like a, it's, it's a movement, you know, and, and Andrew, Sol, uh, uh, Andrew, um, Andrew Sullivan, who is at the, the New Republic, New Republic. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, he has a term called Christianist, which he, he, he uses the same way. He's like, you know, there's people who use their religion to inform a certain political agenda that they think is reinforced by a certain orthodoxy of that term. So I, I, that may be the best I can do. Yeah. 
Okay, uh, let me ask another one. Um, there's more being written and handed out as I speak, so I'll, I'll, I'll get a fresh batch. This question, what about people like Richard Dawkins, uh, neo-atheism? I guess, the, you know, the way I'd rephrase that is um, Dawkins and a number of other writers, Sam Harris and others, have been much in the news lately. Christopher Hitchens is another one for, for uh, writing best-selling books that say, you know, all of religion is BS. Um, what's, what do you make of these people and their view, and why is there so much attention uh, given to this at this moment? Well, first of all, understand that atheism is a religion. They hate that. They <laughs> hate that. So just to like <laughs> no, it's, I mean, it's, it, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a belief system, you know? And uh, I think that, um, that any kind of, any, any sort of, anyone who takes up a kind of religious sword of one kind or another um, immediately has an audience because they do have sort of a, a loud and prominent voice, you know? And I think that, that you know, that's sort of like one of the, extreme examples that it gets wide play, you know? And it takes an oppositional position. Well, I, I will say something about that, um, because when, when we started um, religion on the Huffington Post, there, were, like, there was like a concerted effort by the atheists to shut religion down on Huffington Post. Really? You know, oh yeah, yeah, I mean, the, we, you know, it, you know, an example, David Wolpe, uh, Rabbi David Wolpe wrote, wrote a piece about like, you know, raising your child Jewish. And it was a really nice piece. And like, the atheists just attacked this piece. It got a thousand posts, all anti, like you're indoctrinating, you're lying to your child. So, <laughs> so, um, and- How do you feel about the tooth fairy? You know, no, they, they, that's, they, they equivalent. It's absolutely the equivalence. And so, so I think, I think, I, um, I treat atheism as uh, a way of approaching things. It's, it's very tricky for me because I have, I have a lot of atheists who want to be on the religion section. But, I, and I have some of them who are on there who are interested in it through a interfaith engagement way of doing it. Um, but, but most of them just want to talk about how much how, idiot, how idiotic everybody is. And I do have rules for the religion section, which is you can't use HuffPost religion to attack another person's religion. You can talk about your own religion, lift up the best of your own tradition, but don't use it, because it would be a cage match so Every quickly. Every day, yeah. yeah. And so, so, you know, so I, I'm like, the women don't have misogynists on their section. I don't have to have yeah. atheists on mine. Okay. Um, Here's another question from the audience, uh, and keep sending them in. You know, we have a few more minutes. Um, it was a big deal when Kennedy became the first Catholic president. What has changed? Does it matter that we have two Mormon candidates? Uh, how would it change America to have a Mormon president? There was, I was just talking about this with a friend of mine who's a political editor at ABC News, and I said, you know, I kind of wonder if the whole Mormonism thing is hurting Romney. Um, and she said, no, it's more the lack of personality thing. I said, are you? <laughs> um, and I didn't quote her by name, did I? No. no. Oh, okay, good. Um, but, you know, there was a very recent Pew Center report that came out that the number one word associated with Mormonism in Americans is cult. Um, and it does make you wonder if it is having an impact, if it's, uh, you know, considered a cult by a majority of Americans, and, and if that is off-putting, especially in a primary um, audience that is made up of a lot of Christian conservatives and evangelicals. Well, yeah, I think, um, Alan, we had a piece in the, in the Sunday section, Alan, um, not Alan Bloom, but Harold Bloom, uh, the eminent scholar from Yale, and he sort of poured over Mormonism, and he, he talked in there about um, Christians who were sort of looking askance, looking down the nose of Mormonism um, to sort of examine their own tradition of faith and the symbols and the central tenets and the central history of their own faith, and they might not find it as extremely different. We, they, what he was saying is uh, that the world has become, to some extent, um, inured to the story of Christianity, 
and that when a, when a new religion comes forward in this way, or new to the public, that the, the whole symbols and the central principles of, principles of it seem strange. Because, but you know, if you strip away your having become used to you know, the idea of the virgin birth, you know, the idea of the ascension of Jesus, you know, if you strip away your having become used to that, then you, you see it in a different light. And um, I do not know, but I, I would say that uh, I live in Brooklyn, and the Long Sherman's Hall around the corner from my house, when the, the Union didn't need it anymore, it became the headquarters of the Latter-day Saints. And uh, they're clean scrubbed, uh, delightful young kids. They walk around with their with their, you know, they're like 12, 15, and they have the tag that says Elder Jim or <laughs> Elder John, and I look at them, and I, you know, and we look out for them, and once I had a meeting with some, I had a meeting with three elders of the, um, of the Mormon church, I mean, at the times, because you, you meet a lot of fascinating people, so three really senior elders came in, and, and I asked them, I said, then why do you have all these kids, you know, dressing the same? You know, they have these, you know, these white shirts and these khaki pants on. And they said, well, you want them to dress in your sort of a normal business dress. I said, you know, the business dress varies in Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I said you, might, you might get a little more play if you threw a little hip hop in there. <laughs> but what I'm saying is I think, but what, what I, I think that even that Mormonism is evolving too. And it's evolving too. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was That's not true. that long ago in our history that black people couldn't be Mormons, you know? But I think, you know, they're recruiting, I think probably they're, I haven't checked into the story for a long time, but you know, they're in Brazil. Oh, yeah. And Brazil is the blackest nation 52%. In, in the hemisphere. So it's evolving. And I think that um, the Romney candidacy will be another step in that. But I think that the news media and the broader cultural, pop cultural media has painted a picture of Mormonism between Big Love and Warren Jeffs and you know the extremism of the Latter-day Saint splinter groups um, to, to paint a picture that may, you know, is not an accurate portrayal of what you know, Mormons, real Mormons are like. You know what it comes down to? What it comes down to is when, when you, um, in your own life, when you meet a person of a different faith who lives next door to you, who eats at the same restaurant, plays in the same basketball league, is in the same PTA, that's where the kind, that's where the kind of uh, growth comes in that way. And that's, you know, well, that's Robert Putnam's book, Amazing yeah. Grace, talked about that, where it's like really about where, who you meet. But the truth is, is that you know, the person who introduced Rick Perry his pastor, First Baptist Church of Dallas, said <laughs> that Mormonism was a cult, and a lot of evangelicals believe that. And then a lot of liberals also believe that Mormonism is basically just a front for conservative policies. And so it's a you know it, we can we we place on it a lot. I actually think Newt Gingrich is going to have problems with his Catholicism. Uh, I think a lot of evangelicals do not trust Catholics. I mean, John Hagee called it the whore of Babylon in the last uh, election. John and McCain really paid for that. Yeah. And so this is, you know, this, this is all still there. I think it, it but we still have, we have, we have Senator uh, Harry Reid, who's a Mormon. You know, and so, you know, so it's, it's, uh, it's hard to remember these various things. Mm -hmm. um, let me read another question. How do you think religion fits into the Occupy Wall Street movement? Well, we, I, I will say something about that. We, one of the first things we did, we, we went down and uh, covered and took great pictures of uh, uh, the um, Yom Kippur service that happened at o Occupy Wall Street. There were about 500 people there, and we, we brought down a staff uh, photographer and, and wrote a piece about it. And um, that piece just took off. And now we have a whole page dedicated to Occupy Faith because all these different religious traditions are down there. There, there are chaplains at each Occupy. There are religious leaders that you know, basically live there. Um, and uh, it's, it's a big story because these people become, like, in some ways, a centering, you know, a centering presence. Um, and I won't say Occupy was started by religious figures, but it certainly has been embraced by many on the religious left. 
uh, as the, the movement they've been waiting for. And Cornell West is joining Union Seminary, and part of that is because he's so inspired by it. And that's, it, what's that? Coming back. Coming back to Union Seminary, that's true. Uh, but, but, you know, this is, he's so, I mean, I just saw him at American Academy of Religion, and, you know, he was just like, there's a wind blowing. I don't feel that wind as strongly, but, but I, I <laughs> No, but I mean, but, but many, many people in the religious communities are feeling that. Um, okay, I'm going to just keep going through. Again, we're, we're getting toward the end, but if we have time for a few more questions, I think. Did Joe Lieberman's vice presidential candidacy in 2000 change the way the media deals with the nexus of religion and politics, and if so, how? If no one has anything to say about it, I will go on to the next question. What do you think? Uh, yeah, that's uh, a good question. I'm glad. What do you think? What I think is that, um, you know, it was net positive. He, um, uh, okay, so let me reel back. Uh, every so often, the uh, Columbia Alumni Office will send me off to, you know, on some kind of glamorous trip to talk to Columbia alumni, particularly during political campaigns. So whenever I go anywhere else in the world, particularly Europe, during a political campaign, the, uh, I always get the question like this. We would never ask a, a candidate for a major office to discuss their religion ever. It's inconceivable. Why is it inconceivable that an American presidential candidate uh, could, could just say, religion's not something I'm prepared to talk about. Um, so, so to most of the rest of the world, you know, high-end politics in, in America seems incredibly religious. Um, but what Lieberman gave you, besides being you know, a Jew, which is, which is one bit of news, uh, was at least a, to some extent, observant Jew. That is, not only did he say in a sort of anodyne way, I am a man of deep faith, but most of these guys, you don't get to see them actually doing <coughs> anything that pertains to that. They just sort of say it, Declare it. check off the box, and that's it. Um, as has often been noted, m you know, most of the recent run of American presidents almost never go to church and that kind of thing. With Lieberman, you know, he, uh, at, we know at least in a visible way he observed the Sabbath and you'd see a picture of him with his wife hand in hand, et cetera. Um, so he, he was more visibly religiously observant. Mm -hmm. um, so within the frame that everybody else in the world thinks all of our presidential politics is nuttily religious, from an American point of view, he sort of made it safe to be more openly religious than the standard. Mm -hmm. Not that anybody else has really gone there since, since him, but I, I think that has something, some, some salience. Um, I'm gonna do just a couple more questions. Uh, this is uh, what you might call the local angle, given where we are, so I'll ask it, because uh, in journalism we're trained to do that. Uh, in your opinion, what is the main topic of discussion concerning Judaism in the media and why? I, I feel like the, actually for Judaism, intrafaith questions are really, really um, salient. And so how, um, how to be one Jewish community while still having a lot of um, of s mutual distrust between, say, more less observant Jews and you know the kind of strong orthodoxy. Um, I saw this at the Princeton campus with um, Hillel and Chabad, um, but I think that there's a wider issue, and I think that this is you know it's kind of how do we remain unified within our very very disparate uh, views around almost every single issue. Is is Israel a religion story? Uh, <laughs> Tricky question. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I, my colleagues are, are uh, better suited. I, I, if religion is the prime mover, or if it's because of a religious a religious a fig, uh, a fi, um, uh, leader who is holding forth on the question of Israel, grounded in their religious tradition and using that as their reason, then it's a religion story. Otherwise, it's a lot of other things story. Religion, I mean, Israel's a political story, and, 
and re religious factionalism is a sort of a subset of that story. Uh, okay, let me do, but, but I mean, the answer to the question to me is, if you ask what, what story that is in some way either implicitly or explicitly in quotes Jewish, what that gets covered in the American press, it's Israel. Um, yeah, I think it's it, either it's, the it's, Israel it's, or the American Jewish lobby. Um, right, which is Israel. Yeah, Israel. yeah, I think that is the one area and, and sort of the anti-Semitism that surrounds both the policy as it's executed in the Middle East and ha as it's sort of what its pressure points are domestically. Um, let me just do one more question uh, before Bert will come and wrap us up. Uh, how do you determine who will cover religious stories? What are their professional requirements? Doctorate, master's degree? Well, I, actually, I don't, I don't know um, what the credentials of the reporters are. I have no idea. And, and I don't know um, what their educations are, and I know that people rotate through people rotate through that story the same way they'll rotate through politics. And I think that one of the new religion reporters just came off of education, and and will probably may go out of that into politics. So it'll, it's just it's just seen as one text of the news that people rotate through that have the same qualifi qualifications as anyone else. Um, we uh, the. Religion is being covered, being covered mostly out of my area with a, a religion reporter and, and news wires. Um, sometimes in this current election, it, it's, it's also a political story, so it can come out of the politics and their credentials are somewhat different. But a lot of our content is written by religious people about their own religion, and that is, um, and, and basically I vet that and I read that, and if I think that they're, you know, they have a decent point and a, a good narrative, then I, I publish it. Is, is for a religion reporter, is being a religious practitioner a, a plus credential, a minus credential, or completely immaterial? Well, I think it, it might, uh, you know, who the last guy I had? Uh, what was that fellow's name, Ari? Um, yeah, Peter Steinfeld. Yeah. Um, he, I think, you know, I think he enjoyed his job <laughs> because he was a religious person. And he I was a religious person. He, he, I think he is a religious person. Is, I'm sorry. But he sorry. Is, but I'm talking about when we work together. Um, but he, he enjoyed it. And so I think that's, that's sort of a plus in your job. Yeah. You know, it's a hodgepodge at ABC. The Peggy Waymeyer, who was the religion correspondent, didn't have necessarily religious credentials. She had, I think, been in lay leadership. Um, Dr. Timothy Johnson is a uh, reverend, um, and but he didn't really do religion stories per se, although occasionally he'd do sort of faith and healing. Um, and Dan Harris is uh, would define himself as an agnostic, I know, and he uh, pokes fun at his own when he started the beat, his own uh, religious illiteracy, if you will, and. Um, but I think that reflects, in many ways, you know, the American populace. Because on on the one hand, we are, we identify as highly religious, but we our our religious literacy is pretty low. I'll just say I don't I don't think someone has to be religious per se to cover religion any more than someone has to be religious per se to teach religion. Um, I think someone has to have a sense of generosity towards their subject matter, no matter who that is. Uh, and so that they can be honest and approach it with eyes open, even a heart open. I mean, our, our, our religion reporter is, uh, is, is, is Muslim, raised Muslim. I'm not sure exactly about his personal practice. And the first story he covered was the um, May 21st, uh, Harold Camping, end of the world story. And he went in there with a heart open and we got a beautiful story about seeing this through the eyes of the people who believed it, whether he appreciated their belief or not, that didn't matter. But what we got was a really clear picture of the people who did believe it. I, I wanna thank you all and, and I wanna be particular with my thanks. Um, I am a, uh, a I'll be confessional. I'm a news junkie. I read two papers in the morning and I'm constantly on the web checking this site, that site, even the New York Times. Um, and I would like to think of myself as an educated reader. But I think tonight what we were really privileged to see 
from a variety of different media, the web, uh, television, print, and a journalism school, we, we were privileged to see how news is created from the inside. What the people that, you know, my wife can attest to this, I, I rant every morning when I read the papers or at the television. Actually, I'm looking around the room. Most of us rant. I'm seeing people patting each other, yes. Um, we rant at the television or at the computer um, as we're reading these stories. Um, so tonight, I think we all had an opportunity to hear from insiders, to hear from the people who shape the news. And I have to also say that when um, Nick Lemon and I talked about this, and, and I, I want to thank um, Professor Lemon because he, he was so thoughtful in giving me so much time in talking through what I wanted to happen. Uh, we began with him saying, well, I'm a little nervous. We'll just all stipulate that the media does a terrible job covering religion, and then what are we going to say? <laughs> and I think what we learned tonight um, is that even if we might think that, that from the media's perspective, they're spending a lot of time thinking about religion and trying to find ways to cover it that actually also help them in their business models. Um, and I mean, would you have thought you'd come here and hear an editorial writer for the New York Times talk about how pious the New York Times editorial is? Um, and now we're gonna read it differently every day. We're gonna look for the hidden scripture every day in the New York Times. In the banking one. Yes, so um, I, I just, I think I speak for all of us uh, when I thank the panel for your frankness, your openness, and the education you gave us tonight. Um, I just want to thank Bert and also my friend Lori Kaufman, who is a graduate and friend of uh, JTS, which is why I'm here tonight, but thank you all so much. Yes, and, and let me uh, also echo that. Thank you all for coming. We, we love to see this room full of people from the community, and we hope you'll come to Finkelstein Institute events in the future. Thank you.